I'm here to talk about shifting organizational culture, and because I'm an academic, I can't resist uh, informing you all a little bit about theory, but I mostly am going to tell the story of one school district, but I'm going to end it by telling you how change in one school district um, helped, it's not responsible for, but helped create change in another school district as well, how change moves through communities. So um, I present on engaging people and organizational change to lots of audiences, to uh, businesses and local government. Whenever I present, these are the questions that people ask. How do we engage staff? Sometimes staff say to me, how do we get leaders on board? And um, sometimes people say, well, we have resistors in our organization. How do we engage them? So I think you'll find some answers to this, though I'm not going to do this uh, answer these specifically in order, but be listening for answers to these questions because I think they're all in here. So we're going to talk about the Cooter School District, which is a leader in sustainability. Um, they have had over two-thirds of their building Energy Star labeled for the last three years. Uh, one of their schools has had 100, has a, an, Ener an Energy Star score of 100 for the last two years. They have another that gets a 99, um, and that's just a quirk of how the calculation happens. It really should be 100 because it has a lower KBTU, but it's a quirk of the formula. And um, they were the first to lead certified silver high school in the state of Colorado, and they were the first lead gold for schools when the, gold, when the lead certification for schools came out. So they've been a leader. They were the first to Energy Star label their buildings um, and put their buildings into portfolio manager in the state of Colorado. And they're in my backyard. I graduated from the Poudre School District, so I'm an alum. So this is what brought me in. The uh, energy folks were looking at this graph. Is this, a, do we have a laser pointer on this? Yes, no? By the flowers, oh, here we go. So the operations guys, in 2000, there was a bond to build new schools, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, but they had designed and built these green schools. And so this one here, this blue line, is Fossil Ridge High School, the new lead, lead certified high school. And this red line, kind of coincident with it, is Rocky Mountain High School built in 1973. And they were looking at this 24 hour graph of energy consumption and they said, what is Rocky doing down here? How did that happen? We did not know this was possible. We designed this school, Fossil Ridge, to be 40% more efficient than Rocky. What's it doing down there? So that's what they brought me in for, was to answer that question. And so the first thing I did was look at energy consumption in all four of their high schools over a several year period. And that blue line on the bottom, you can see, is Rocky Mountain High School. And you know it's a bumpy graph because uh, energy consumption in high schools is really seasonal. You know It drops way down in the summer. So I looked at their energy consumption over a 10 year period and figured out what was happening in the schools. And as soon as I did that, I realized that what was happening at Rocky, why Rocky saved 50%, was not mostly about that school. It was mostly about the organizational change that happened in facilities and operations. And so when we compare Poudre School District to other districts in the state that share data with each other, these are the biggest school districts in the state, Poudre School District uses 25% less energy overall. They use 33% less electricity per square foot, and they spend 37% less. So notice that their savings, their dollar savings is greater than their energy, and that's because part of their energy management is really coincident peak management. So um, we can talk about that. So this is the organizational structure of most school districts. This is kind of generic organizational structure. There's an assistant superintendent for elementary schools, an assistant superintendent for uh, secondary schools, if it's a district that has both types. Some Californias and others are small districts, but big districts look like this. Then there's a group of people that are just focused on student achievement and accountability and testing. And then operations is over on the side, and it's separate from, there's really a bifurcation. And this is really similar to other organizations that there's the business side of the organization, and then there's the operations side of the organization, and never the twain shall meet. So this is a story about organizational change that started in operations and actually transformed the whole district. So normally the folks in operations think of their role as service. It's our job 
to serve kids by busing them, feeding them, housing them, and making a safe place for them. So I just wanted you to see this uh, structure piece, that the change really happened in this quadrant, and it infected the entire organization. All right, so here's the theory part. We'll keep this quick. Uh, there's an organizational studies person who has done all kinds of studies on change initiatives for all kinds of things. This is not related specifically to sustainability and looked at hundreds of cases of organizations that have tried to make change and said, what are the characteristics that identify successful transformation efforts? Not just little initiatives, not tiny programs, but big initiatives. And they all have these eight key components. And those of you who are working on change, you can get your checklist out as I go and say, yeah, we're doing that, or no, we could work on this. So we're going to talk about these eight things and what this district has done. So the first one is you can't really get an organizational transformation going if there's not some sense of urgency as well. We all know in the building world and especially in schools and in the public sector generally, any city government, county government or public schools or higher education are faced with the same urgency. They're spending a lot of money, they have bad designs, they have buildings like this one, this is Fort Collins High School that is uncomfortable and, it, and they're facing environmental concerns. Right now this district is in the middle of retrofitting a bunch of schools and they did blower tests on all the old schools. This one is the biggest energy hog of all the high schools and the blower, desk, the blower door tests on this one showed that this school has the equivalent of two large garage doors open all the time. When you add up all their space, two open garage doors, no wonder the people in this building are uncomfortable. So here's your urgency. So in 1999, they formed a green team. They said, you know what? We care about places that are comfortable for kids, and we want to do something better. So they started with a green team, and it was headed up by the folks in operations and facilities. And it included their accounts manager, the people who handled uh, paying the utility bills and stuff. And that is uh, kind of a key person, as well as the district architect. So it was kind of small. All right. So. Uh, Point number one, have some urgency. Point number two, build a team of change agents. You guys are all familiar with green teams. Number three, communicate the vision. Have a vision and know how to communicate it. This was a really big hurdle back in 1999 and 2000. In Colorado, we live in the conservative west, where green is a four-letter word. And they overcame that hurdle of why green by saying, by creating a vision. And they said, we want to build schools that teach. We want the buildings to teach. We want them to be cost effective. We want them to be energy efficient. We want them to be comfortable for two students and staff. And we want them to be a healthy place for kids to go. And all of those things define sustainable buildings. They define green buildings. They define high performance buildings. But the only label that worked is high performance building. Sociologists call this framing, and a successful frame incorporates all of the things that people think are wrong and overcomes resistance. So um, in Vail Resort, the eco-terrorists uh, burnt it down, and this was in our own backyard around the same time. And so people had this presumed association that green meant you were an environmental extremist, that you worked for Greenpeace. This is crazy. You guys all know that facilities and operations folks are typically blue collar workers. They're not normally Greenpeace members. So these were, this was kind of the cultural context when they started this green team. And high performance building got them over these problems, this idea that this kind of mythical fixed pie is one of the hurdles for a green building, that we think that if you build green, it's going to cost more, and that uh, you can't have all those things. They're not compatible with each other and also thinking that green is too expensive, that it's not fiscally responsible when you're trying to sell it to a board of education and to public funders. You know, you have to demonstrate that you're being fiscally responsible. So they had to overcome all these, and they did it by creating a frame, high performance building, that incorporated the values that existed in the school district, and there were four of those. We care about uh, the learning opportunities for kids, we care about it being a healthy place. We care about being good stewards of the resources. And one of the really important things, the folks in facilities thought that everybody who works in facilities and operations are professionals, 
and they're knowledgeable who have a lot of value to add. And the way we treat them right now as not professional is a missed opportunity. That because we don't treat them as professionals and value what they bring, we're missing that opportunity. So these are all the things when you ask them what's wrong right now that motivated them to have a green team and to build green schools. So they called it high performance building. They communicated a vision. And so this one, number four, this is probably the one piece of advice that people need to hear the most. And I heard from the folks at Eden, I don't see Jennifer in the room, there she is. I heard her say this four times I was counting in her presentation. We communicate, we communicate, we communicate, we communicate in lots of ways. And communicating once about your vision and about what you're doing is not adequate. It's not enough. You have to communicate in every channel you have. If you have newsletters, if you have meetings, if you have blogs, whatever ways your organization communicates, that's where and when you need to communicate the vision. Under communicating the vision is one of the biggest reasons that change efforts fail. So if you're looking at how can we do better, ask yourself, are we communicating enough? The fifth one is removing barriers. And this is the one I want to talk to you the most about that is actually kind of the most complicated. What this group did with their green team was build a robust social network. And this social network overcame all of the barriers that have been identified by researchers. Uh, Andy Hoffman and Rebecca Henn from the University of Michigan wrote about barriers to green building, that there are individual barriers, there are organizational level barriers, and there are barriers associated with your industry, right? With the culture of construction or of property management. And you need to overcome all three of those in order to be successful. Building a robust and highly integrated social network can overcome all of those. And so that's what I want to tell you about. So social network analysis is a particular kind of analysis that sociologists do. And we look at who's connected to other people and how they're connected. So this is a picture of the learning network for this group. We asked the people that were part of the green team and part of the design phase for all of these new green buildings. We asked them who did they learn from, and we asked them who learned from them. We also asked them about support, and we asked them about leadership. And those three networks are super highly correlated. Um, one of the really interesting things about this network is its overall structure. In the middle, you see all of these kind of nodes that are really tightly clustered together here in the middle, and they're pretty big. Those blue nodes are people who work for the school district in operations services. There are also red nodes, which is the district administration. You can guess who that is in the middle, the superintendent. And there are yellow nodes that belong to the district. These are teachers over here. So teachers were part of this network of people who were learning about what should green schools be and what do they need to include, how do we design them. The core of this network has about 40 people in it. So all of the trades in operations, but it also has all of the industry people outside. It has the architects and the engineers, and it also has this, what in social network analysis we call a periphery. These lots of people outside that are not very well connected in the middle. When you have a tightly connected core and a diverse group outside, that is how you speed up innovation that the outside brings in new knowledge and especially specialized and different knowledge. And a densely connected core in the middle it has the ability to accomplish complex tasks. And I think everybody in this room understands that designing and building good buildings and not ending up with the problems that we get from value engineering, it, that happens when you have a densely connected core like this. So they, um, on their green team, had everybody, architects, the main engineers, um, a sustainability consulting company, all of those people were together. 40 some people were part of that middle core and then they drew knowledge from other people. They sent people on site visits to visit other schools to learn about um, say ground source heat pumps, the kinds of new technologies they were thinking about putting in their buildings. They sent people out to learn from them. Uh, the folks from EPA and Energy Star are in here. All of those people are in that outside network. So building relationships used to look like this. The owner, in this case, prior to this bond and these green schools, it was the assistant superintendent for secondary schools 
who contracted with an architect and said to the architect, hey, can't build me a building. I want it to be this big. It needs to hold this many kids. And that person interacted with the folks on their design team. Then the assistant superintendent coordinated with the construction coordinator in the school. But all those people in the little white squares, they, that's where the knowledge resides in the organization. And they were not a part of design projects. And that's how we ended up with Fort Collins High School, the one that has two garage doors of uh, open air coming in. So that's how construction used to happen. And that's something you all are probably familiar with. This is how construction happened this time. This is the core. And so what you see here in this network are um, these squares are all people that do not work for the district. And the circles are all people in the district. But notice there are one, two, three, four, five. Five levels of organizational hierarchy on this team, including the superintendent, including architects, including directors, and including line staff electricians, plumbers, and HVAC maintenance guys. So five levels of organizational hierarchy in this network that's so densely connected. One of the things we do when we do network analysis is look at, are there any corners of the network that are more likely to associate with each other than others? And in this network, there's none. There are no communities. There are no subgroups. There are no cliques. In fact, when I ran this analysis, I thought I was doing something wrong. I thought this couldn't be possible because I know enough about network theory to know that a network this large, that's this densely connected, is almost unheard of. I'd never seen one. I'd never done analysis on one. So then I took it um, to the folks who design social network analysis software. And I said, hey, I have this cool network. And they said, what? Let's run that again, because they also were in disbelief. So I want you to understand that. You know, it looks like a ball of string here, but actually that ball of string tells us something really important, that these people were all talking to each other, learning from each other, supporting each other in their role, and thinking of each other as leaders. So that's what the core of the network looks like, and this is what a dense core looks like. So they were learning from each other and getting support, and they were overcoming those barriers. So one of the other components of successful change initiatives is creating short-term wins. So this is Zach Elementary. This is a learning wall. And you can see these. this is labeled hot water, cold water, uh, column, metal stud. So they have these open walls that are teaching walls in all of the new green schools so that kids can see what's inside the walls of their school. And the students are trained to do tours of the buildings. So if you want to learn about their green buildings, you can visit these schools. And it will be a student who um, tells you about the infrastructure of the building and what the features are that make that a green school. So this was really important. They designed a prototype for elementary schools first. And that's a successful strategy that lots of school districts use. Elementary schools are smaller, so they are easier kind of small wins. And you can create a prototype that works once, and you can replicate it over and over again. So this is how they started, was a prototype for one school. Once they started winning national awards for this, all the resistance that they had from superintendents was gone. And they made the really smart choice of not sending the architect and the people that had worked hard on this. They sent the other people, the people that had been the resistors, the leadership in the organization that was not so sure. They sent them to receive the award. So just a little strategy for you. How do you create buy-in? So in 2009, this is what the green team looked like. You can tell it has quadrupled in size over a decade. And so these are the things I want you to understand that are about that network. This is what uh, the folks had to say. I wasn't going to say, we're building a high performance building, whether you like it or not. People would sabotage that. It would not work. You have to say, here's some interesting things. Go find out about them. I trust you enough. You're the experts. Go find out and tell me what we should be doing. And so the function of the green team, they sent every member of it to go and find out about any green technology. And it could be in their field or not in their field. You could be an HVAC guy that was learning about you know, green landscaping. And it was brought back to the team. They developed sustainable design guidelines their own. They didn't design to lead standards because they had their own sustainable design guidelines. And they asked the question in these team meetings, does this material or this construction technique meet our standards? Does it meet our, 
our design guidelines isn't the smart choice. And that overcomes individual resistance, inertia, the kinds of things that make uh, choices that people don't want to make. So here's what uh, one of the folks said. It was a learning experience for me. If I'm going to find something, I can't just say, I know. I've got to have facts and numbers. Everybody's here smart enough. If they look at the facts and the numbers, they're going to go the right way. I've had to back off, too, because I see the numbers, and I've had to go with others' ideas, too. It sort of goes both ways. So I don't want you to underestimate the importance of this. This isn't just someone saying, oh, there's kind of give and take. This is the description of what a dense network provides, that it creates accountability, the opportunity for bringing in new information, and most importantly, the avenue for making decisions that are based on information and the latest knowledge, rather than on habit and gut instinct or whatever we think is expedient in the short term. And overcoming those things is the big hurdle to really having innovation in green buildings. So mutual learning. The other really important thing was that they got support from outside organizations, from other school districts that had tried it, from government agencies that wanted to see green schools happening. So the energy manager said this, we're able to do what we did because we had all these great partners from utility, Energy Star, <coughs> architects, everyone. So a couple of stories about that. When they first started talking about building green buildings, they weren't sure what they could accomplish. They really had no idea, and this was more than a decade ago now. And they said, oh, let's shoot for 10% more efficient. And the utility, the local utility company said, that's silly. We think you could go for 40%. They didn't think it was possible at all, the folks in the school district, but the utility said, we think you should shoot for 40. And they were on the green team, and so they shot for 40, and they made it. So here's a little uh, placard that's in schools that's connected to the behavior. These were funded by the city utility and then placed on all the light switches in the school um, by students. So this is just a little physical artifact of that partnership between utilities and uh, the school district. So another person that really uh, helped them, this mutual support where it created change, was the local consulting company. They knew the importance of having leadership involvement. And so in 1999, they adopted sustainability design guidelines. In 2000, the consulting company said, you know, we really think that you need to have a clear indication from leadership that this is what you're about. And so the superintendent wrote a letter and posted on the website that said, we're committed to sustainable design. And so that if anybody questioned, they were empowered by that superintendent's um, comment. So if you look at the learning network, the superintendent um, is the tiniest node. If you look at who learned from him, almost no one in the network said that they learned from the superintendent. But if you look at the network the other way around, and you look at who said they learned the most, the superintendent is one of the biggest nodes. So when we think about the role of leadership, leadership needs to communicate the vision and support it. And so if you look at who was giving support, Lots of people said that they got support from the superintendent, but he wasn't the one that was knowledgeable about the change. So you don't need to be the expert, you just need to support it and articulate the vision and communicate it in a way that people feel that the organization is committed to it. So this is what I've learned from working with these folks. Energy management has three kind of approaches. You can be focused on operations of the building. What are you doing in your daily routines in a building? You can be focused on the facility itself. Sometimes you need equipment upgrades, you need retrofits, you need new windows. Some of those things can really make a big difference. You also have the opportunity to be focused on behavior. Most school districts are not doing all three of these things. And this is what we learned from Rocky Mountain High School, is that you get to 50% by doing all three of these things. There's um, another high school in the district that this year I'm so excited to say is about to hit the 50% mark. They've hit the 50% mark in a few months, so they haven't quite hit it for the whole year. They've hit it 48% um, against the baseline that the school district you know, originally created, said this is our baseline year and let's track change from here. So they've achieved a 48 or 49% reduction, and they went from being 35%. When I studied Rocky and uh, they had hit 50, this other high school had only hit 35%. We wanted to know where did that 15% come from it came from behavior. The first 35% came from what they're doing with operations and what they were doing with facilities. 
So in order to hit 50, you have to have all three. At least that's my experience from these schools. So this is what this district did. In 93, they hired an energy manager who works on procurement and peak demand management. In 2000, they centralized all of the heating, venting, and air conditioning. They started putting all of their uh, buildings into Portfolio Manager and Energy Star. The money that they saved from doing that stuff, they were able to roll into facilities changes and upgrades. And so that's one of their policies and practices is anytime we have savings, we roll it in. And in fact, they're the ones who operations paid me to do the first study because they said, it's worth it for us to spend money on research to find out what this school did because if we can replicate it, we can save even more. In one year, uh, what they say the year change from 2006 to 2007 in that school saved them $46,000. So, you know, that's worth a tiny little research contract to find out what that difference is. So they reinvest all of their money. Then they got the letter from the superintendent. In 2005, they were one of the first districts in the country to adopt a sustainability management system that for facilities, and they do an annual sustainability report. So if you get online and you Google Cooter School District sustainability, you can see all of their stuff. They try to post stuff, and they have videos and other kinds of educational stuff. Then they have a team that works with utilities and their partners. They call it the Energy Rules Team, and it's about to change its name. It's probably about to become the sustainability team. And they work with um, energy teams in schools and with teachers and with environmental education. So this is what this district is doing and how these three things are connected to each other. They're not disconnected. It's not one effort. All of those are interconnected with each other. So there's another school district in the state that has been influenced and affected by this network of change, and that's Douglas County School District. They hired a sustainability energy manager in um, 2005 or 2006, and his entire job is focused only on that behavior piece. I showed you those three quadrants. He only does behavior, and so that's why in this little wheel, he's the biggest cog in the wheel, right? So in his district, just focusing on behavior has started to push change in operations and facilities, because if kids can save us money, and we're talking millions of dollars in that district, then maybe we should be thinking about sustainability in the operations quadrant. So here's what Douglas County has done since 2007. So this is um, the actual number of their schools that are in each of the quartiles for Energy Star scores. So in 2007, 45 schools were in the 0 to 25 range with their Energy Star ratings. And 14 of their schools had a score of 26 to 50. And one school was over 50. This was their Energy Star portfolio when they hired their energy manager. This is their portfolio in 2011. They have five new schools that are in the top quartile. And you can see that their distribution is a much improved district. They have some schools that have changed their Energy Star rating 70 points. Yeah, they have gone from a 20 to a 90. They have some schools you know, that are still down here in the 20s <laughs> because they're not playing. They're not engaged. But anybody who's above 50 is doing a behavior program. So that's just an example of someone else who's changed. Now I want to show you what's the network chain that created change. One of the things I want you to understand is that your relationships with other organizations have the potential to change you and to change them. So utilities were, was the organization that said, we know how much you can change. We think that 40% is realistic, and we want to help you hit it. So utility, the utility company was an important first partner, and they defined this target. The school district then chose to use the integrated design build process. And they required a competition to design that first prototype. They required the architects to relate to them differently. They said, no more of this linear relationship, no more of us just handing you a check, telling you to design a building. Now you need to do it with us and design it with us. So one example of how, what that produced was in Fossil Ridge High School, the lead silver school, they, their building is designed as kind of a three-armed star. And the HVAC, uh, the head of that department said, I think 
that this should be three systems. And the engineer said, no, I don't think so. And since they had committed as a group to doing information-based decisions, the only choice was to model it. And they modeled both. They modeled one system, and they modeled three systems. And which one do you think won? Three. Three systems won, and three systems is an award-winning system. And it only came about because of that connection where people from operations were asked about their feedback and their knowledge was brought into the network and they made decisions based on it. Not based on intuition or gut instinct, but based on information. So the, integration, the integrated design build process and the green team created that change. It made it possible. Then the architect, he said, as soon as we saw this bid, we knew that we were going to have to change the way we operate. We knew that we needed to be different. So we sent our whole staff, anybody that might touch any of these buildings, and sent all of them, this is in the year 2000, remember, right? In the early 2000s, sent all of them and had them get accredited as lead accredited professionals. And so they were one of the first architect firms in the city to really get most of their staff up to speed rather than just having one lead AP person. That architect now designed the prototype for Douglas County, the one I told you that made big change by starting with behavior. So they designed their prototype. And their recently designed prototype that was designed a few years ago, it was designed to hit 46 KBTU. And they knew it could, because they'd already proven that success with the Poudre School District schools. They said 46 KBTU is not an unrealistic goal. So that's what they designed it for. What do you think they got? What? 25. Not quite that good. The actual on those buildings is between 35 and 42. And so now they have a, they have a phase two prototype. And the goal for the phase two prototype is 35. So these organizations are part of a network that are learning from each other. And each phase improves the performance somewhere else. So that social network is not just about what's, what Pooter got from it, but it's also what other districts that interact with them and that are working with teams that those engineers and contractors and architects, that's changing the face of schools all up and down the front range in Colorado. So this is what I want to lead you with about leadership. I know people are always asking this, what should leaders do? So this is the recommendation for formal leaders. This is when you're the head of your company. The research on organizational change said that these are the things that you can do that makes the biggest difference. You can articulate the vision. You can empower your staff. You need to give them decision-making power. At Rocky Mountain High School, the school that reduced their energy consumption by 50%, the custodian was placed on the school accountability team. Now, you know accountability teams are all about student achievement and performance, right? They're not about environmental. They're not about energy. They're about school performance. The custodian was put on that team. And he said, because he had that power, he then felt like he had permission to ask other people to change their behavior. So he changed custodial routines for his school. He changed them for the other schools. He changed some of the rules for operations generally. And he convinced all of the athletic department to change what they did with the lights in their quadrant of the schools. And in high schools, what athletic teams are doing is actually a really big deal in terms of energy consumption. So, Giving people decision-making power doesn't just change what they do. It changes their interaction in the network in the school. Uh, providing individual support. Like I said, the superintendent had the high, one of the highest scores for I gave support, one of the lowest scores for I learned. And that's fine. He doesn't need to be the expert on green buildings. He just needs to support it. And they need to set high performance standards. There's actually a lot of mixed research about what leaders ought to do and what they should do. So I've taken all that literature and just condensed it down here. Other studies, this is what they found. And all of these are consistent with what happened in this district, that they set high standards for what people are actually achieving. But those formal leaders are not the only part of organizational change in a district. There also are other people. And this is the Bacon Elementary School. This is their little energy team. This is the team that Farrah McDill, who you heard about already, this is a team that she studied for her master's thesis. And what informal leaders do, we call them, in sociology, we call them charismatic leaders. They inspire others. 
by their values and their actions and their communications with other people. And anybody can inspire others. At Rocky Mountain High School, they're different than the other high schools. They hit 50% reduction first because their principal was identified as a charismatic leader, their environmental studies teacher was identified as a charismatic leader, their custodian was identified as a charismatic leader, and their students were identified as charismatic leaders. At Bacon, we have sixth graders that are charismatic leaders. They're inspirational to others. They model expected behavior. They communicate the expectations. They tell people, this is what we expect you to do in our space, in our school, in your job. And they also encourage others and empower them to take action. So that story that we heard about the woman who's turning off the shower, she's one of those people that has the potential to be an informal leader because she inspires others by modeling that behavior. All right, did I make it in 20 minutes? Yes, <laughs>